Earth, our home planet, the only place in the universe known to support life. Yet could life forms from outer space already have paid us a visit? Could they even be abducting members of the human race? It may seem like science fiction, but has planet Earth already had a close encounter? Stories of close encounters with alien life are part of our culture. Every year in the U.S., there are thousands of reported sightings of UFOs, unidentified flying objects, and some people even claim to have been abducted by aliens. I'm a perfectly normal individual that's had rather extraordinary and odd experiences my entire lifetime. Natural phenomena or even military activities can explain most of the UFO incidents, but some still keep people guessing. There's no way that it was balloons or an aircraft or helicopters or flares. People actually saw a mile to two mile wide craft. Flying saucers have invaded our planet. Skeptics argue that such sightings and close encounters are merely figments of our imagination perhaps inspired by science fiction movies and popular culture. If you have a dream about an alien in the middle of the night, what is your alien going to look like? Your alien is going to look like my alien, the alien we, we both saw on television. Although even respected scientists admit that real aliens could have the capability to travel vast distances across the cosmos to visit Earth. There is no law of physics preventing a civilization, perhaps a million years more advanced than ours, from reaching the planet Earth. Some believe that there is overwhelming evidence that aliens have visited us, possibly on many occasions throughout history, leaving artifacts and messages ranging from crop circles to the pyramids. I saw some strange objects and strange lights. I saw some things I couldn't explain definitely under intelligent control. For those of you that are skeptical, I would ask that you look at all the incidents. There are some very serious things out there. Some incident really needs some investigation. In 1995, Dr. Lynn Kaitai saw lights she could not explain near her home in the mountains, just north of Phoenix, Arizona. She had her camera with her. I really concentrated on that top orb that was starting to disappear. It didn't budge, it just slowly dimmed, as if once it disappeared, it was still there. And I noticed an eerie silence, as if time had stopped. It was just extraordinary and very strange. Two years later, on March 13th, 1997, Kai Tai was also among the thousands of witnesses who shared a remarkable experience. Thousands of people statewide were looking up purposely to the sky on a clear, beautiful night to catch a glimpse of the Hale-Bopp Comet when this mile to two mile wide triangle craft traversed the entire state. I mean, it really went through the most populated corridor of Arizona, totally, totally silent. This was a massive parade throughout the state. Some people find it hard to dismiss the Phoenix Lights case because there were so many eyewitnesses. After a brief investigation, the military revealed that the lights were created by flares released from a squadron of aircraft flying in a V formation. I know what I saw, and thousands of other people know what they saw, and it definitely was not flares. The characteristics are quite different from these orbs. There's no smoke trails. These are balls. These are orbs that are in rock-solid formations. The data speaks for itself. Some people believe that flares are an improbable explanation for the lights over Phoenix. Dr. Michael Shermer, publisher of Skeptic Magazine, thinks the incident highlights the difficulty of judging the truth about UFOs. People are poor eyewitnesses, all of us. Judging the size, motion, and speed of objects in the sky, particularly at night or at dusk, it's very difficult to do. 
Shermer has been writing about the unexplained for over 10 years. He questions not only the quality of the evidence, but also the reliability of human testimonies. When somebody says, oh, it was 200 meters wide in the sky, how do you know? Was it next to something that you knew the size of already and then you can judge it's twice as big as that? No, people just make wild ass guesses. These wild guesses include mistaking military aircraft, weather balloons, flares, and even the planet Venus as alien craft. Yet such sightings lead many people to believe in the existence of UFOs, despite logical explanations from scientists and the US government. Ironically, official denials of UFO landings may actually encourage a popular belief in their existence because of a fascination with conspiracy theories and a fear of government cover-ups, particularly in the infamous case of Roswell. Roswell, this is the mecca of ufology. Initially, the story given that it was a weather balloon was a lie. It was a lie because it was a national security secret. It was a national security secret until 1995, when the government said that Roswell wasn't actually a high-altitude weather balloon, but a high-altitude surveillance balloon to monitor Soviet nuclear tests. This revelation only serves to convince the UFO community that the government are still covering up whatever did happen at Roswell. So the ufology people said, aha, you see, we've been saying that they lie. We go, yeah, right, but they're saying what it actually is. Well, yeah, but that's a lie. No, that makes perfect sense for a Cold War atmosphere in 1947. The mystery surrounding Roswell has been fueled by misinformation and the shifting official explanation that keeps the story alive. Yet sometimes, even the military themselves spot the unusual. In 1980, personnel at an Air Force base on the east coast of England saw a strange light in a nearby forest. Deputy Base Commander Colonel Charles Halt was on duty when he received a strange message from one of his staff. When the on-duty police lieutenant came in and insisted on seeing myself and the base commander and talking to us privately, he was white as a sheet. The lieutenant reported that a strange, unidentified flying object had been seen descending into nearby Rendlesham Forest. Colonel Halt and a disaster preparedness officer visited the supposed landing site. They recorded their mission as evidence. All the birds got quiet, all the animals in the forest were just silent. We approached a site where they said this alleged craft had landed. There were three indentations in the ground, about an inch and a half to two inches deep, about eight to ten inches across. They were about six, seven, maybe eight foot apart, in a nice triangular shape. Being cautious, Colonel Halt and his disaster preparedness officer took radiation readings with their Geiger counter. The levels were four times higher than normal. We got a high radioactive memory, about uh, two to three, maybe four. Then, something moved in the trees. A bright red light with a black center was moving through the trees. There's no doubt about it. There's some kind of strange flash red light in the air itself. It appeared to be shedding something like molten metal, almost like steel coming out of a crucible. As we stood there in awe watching it, it silently exploded and broke into multiple white objects that just disappeared. Many journalists and researchers claim that what Colonel Halt and others actually saw while in Rendlesham Forest was in fact the lighthouse at nearby Orford Ness. But Colonel Halt remains convinced that what he saw wasn't of this world. I know what we saw, but I don't know what it was. And my own personal suspicions are that there may have been a craft that was damaged, injured, or it may have been a reconnaissance vehicle of some type taking a look at all the activity in the area. In January 1981, Colonel Halt contacted the British Ministry of Defense, but never received an official response. He is convinced that his close encounter was genuine and that governments cover up this and other UFO cases. Dr. Michael Shermer is not so sure. The problem with government cover-ups like that is people can't keep their mouth shut. 
if aliens were really here and the government was covering up, surely some lower echelon person would say, I've got the story of a lifetime. Even if governments were trying to cover up UFO incidents, people haven't stopped questioning the official explanations. Either aliens exist or they don't. Either thought is frightening. For any UFO to get here, it would have to travel across space from another part of the universe, light years away. Where might they come from? And just how would they get here? Has Earth ever had a close encounter with an alien civilization? There have been many supposed sightings of UFOs, but no definitive evidence of a visit. But whether or not aliens have dropped into our own backyard, many scientists do believe that they could exist. I would be shocked if we were alone. It would be um, an incredible waste of space <laughs> considering how many galaxies there are. There should be lots of planets like ours with life on them. The universe is about 14 billion years old and expanding at a phenomenal rate. It holds billions and billions of stars, far more stars than there are grains of sand on all the beaches on Earth. And some of these stars have planets orbiting them. There are plenty of places from which ET could originate. Physicist Lawrence Krauss believes that the most likely place for ET to call home would be on a planet similar to our own. Life seems to form ubiquitously, relatively easily in conditions like this. So we, we would expect one simple way to find life would be to look for planets like Earth. The problem is that any such planet is going to be a long, long way from Earth. Outer space distances are so vast, they are measured in light years rather than miles. One light year is a distance of nearly six trillion miles. That's the distance traveled in one year by a beam of light moving slightly in excess of 186,000 miles per second. Light from our own sun reaches Earth in about eight minutes and takes another 10 and a half years to travel to the nearest known planet outside of our solar system. Any alien planning to visit us from this planet faces a round trip of over 120 trillion miles. The only way to shorten the duration of such a journey may be to go faster than the fastest thing we know in the universe, light itself. In 1905, Einstein laid out special relativity. And in that theory, you cannot go faster than the speed of light. There's a cop on the block, in some sense, that says you can't break the light barrier. Einstein's theory of special relativity suggests that there is a cosmic speed limit preventing anything and any alien going faster than the speed of light. However, in 1916, Einstein created an even more powerful theory, the general theory of relativity. It opens up the possibility that instead of beating the laws of physics, the answer might be to get around them. Theoretical physicist Michio Kaku believes that this holds the key to breaking the light speed barrier. Space-time is a fabric, a fabric that can be stretched and compressed and perhaps even ripped. That might give you the possibility to break the light barrier. Einstein's theory proposes that matter causes space-time to curve. Imagine a heavy ball on a rubber sheet. The ball's presence causes the sheet to distort into a hollow. If a smaller ball is then dropped onto the sheet, it will spiral toward a heavier ball. Einstein theorized that space, like the rubber sheet, is warped as objects travel through it. And if space can be warped, then there may be a novel way to travel from one side of the galaxy to the other. 
If you have a sheet of paper, a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. However, there's a loophole. If you are to fold the sheet of paper, then you realize the shortest distance between two points is actually a wormhole. Some scientists suggest that wormholes are space-time tubes, which act as shortcuts connecting distant regions of space. Theoretically, an alien using wormholes could travel between two parts of our galaxy faster than a beam of light could travel through normal space and time. It's a shortcut first described more than 150 years ago by a mathematician in Oxford, England. That man was the author known as Lewis Carroll. Alice's Looking Glass connects the countryside of Oxford to a fantastic world called Wonderland. And if you were to put your hand through the looking glass, your hand would leave Oxford and go to the other side of forever. That is a wormhole, what we physicists call a multiply connected space. Wormholes may be the ideal transportation network, but manipulating the laws of physics could bring catastrophic consequences. You don't know how stable they are. It may be quite radioactive. There may be quantum corrections and radiation as you enter the wormhole, or perhaps it will close up even before you can enter. It may be possible to artificially create a wormhole, but it would take enormous energy and advances in technology way beyond our imagination to rip through the fabric of space and time. But maybe there's an alien civilization so advanced that they can build these supergalactic highways with ease. Intelligent aliens may also have found another trick to navigate around the universe. Perhaps they can actually move space itself. As far as we know, space can do whatever the heck it wants. It can expand in response to the presence of matter and energy. If we could somehow harness that, then in principle you might be able to develop something you might call a warp drive. The alien craft would collapse the space in front of it and simultaneously expand the space behind it. In that way, the ship would transfer from one part of the galaxy to another without actually moving an inch. Our own technology is nowhere near sidestepping the laws of physics. But an alien civilization that has evolved a million years ahead of us might already have found a way. Earthbound physicists who are looking for life take this idea very seriously. They have devised a system to categorize alien civilizations according to how advanced they may be. When we physicists look in outer space, we don't look for little green men, we look for type one, type two, and type three civilizations. A type one alien civilization would be so advanced, it could harness all forms of energy on its planet, including oceans, volcanoes, and even the weather. They would soon exhaust the power of a planet and use the energy of their local star. At this stage, they would be categorized as a type two civilization. Eventually, they become galactic. They begin to colonize entire star systems. They begin to have fantastic energies, allowing them to manipulate stars and black holes. That is type three. Perhaps 100,000 to a million years more advanced than our technology. But where would our own civilization be on this scale? We don't even rate on this scale. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. That's how primitive we are. Our official rating is type zero. We cannot travel across the vastness of interstellar space. However, a type three civilization would have developed the technology needed to control space and time in order to travel freely throughout the universe. You cannot rule out the possibility that an extraterrestrial civilization, perhaps a million years more advanced than ours, have the capability of reaching the planet Earth. But any alien civilization developing ways of traveling across the galaxy to planet Earth still faces potential disaster. If they reach us at all, then the oxygen in our atmosphere 
the very thing that keeps us alive may prove to be deadly poison for our alien visitors. If an alien civilization has successfully learned how to control time and space and cross the interstellar void to visit Earth, they will face a serious danger, our atmosphere. It protects us from solar radiation, but it's a dangerous barrier for any approaching spacecraft. As an object approaches Earth from space, it heats up due to friction with molecules in our atmosphere. The heat burns up most objects, such as asteroids, before they reach the ground. NASA spacecraft use this friction to slow down as they re-enter the atmosphere. Heat-resistant tiles protect them from the intense heat. Without them, the ship would burn up. But some physicists believe that a technologically advanced civilization would solve the problem long before they reach our atmosphere. I would suspect that any intelligent creature with an advanced form of space travel would simply slow down even before it reaches the planet Earth. Having navigated our atmosphere and landed safely on our planet, the aliens face their next big hurdle. It's unlikely they could just step out of their craft. Earth's atmosphere would probably not match exactly the atmosphere on the home planet of a visiting alien. In fact, unless the aliens were adapted to oxygen, they would find the gas extremely poisonous. If aliens come to Earth, you wouldn't expect them to just walk out of their spacecraft and breathe the air and start eating apples and oranges. Here in the Mojave Desert in Nevada, NASA's Space Science Division studies how Earth's basic organisms live in extreme environments. From this, they hope to ascertain how different species might survive potentially hazardous conditions. Leading the research is Dr. Chris McKay. We take for granted that life needs oxygen, and we all need it, plants and animals need oxygen. But we have developed very special machinery and enzymes for detoxifying oxygen. Oxygen is intrinsically poisonous. But would evolution have happened in the same way on the home planet of an alien visitor? Would they have evolved to cope with oxygen? In an extreme case, the fundamental chemistry might be completely different with different gases. Dr. McKay studies samples that contain over 10 million bacteria. They reveal that some species here exist using totally different principles to the vast majority of life on Earth. If we look at the bacteria, we get a glimpse of how strange chemistry really can be, how these organisms can be really so, so alien. The strength of our sun poses another problem for visiting aliens. The energy from its rays supports life on Earth, but it can be dangerous. Too much sun can blind humans, burn us, or even cause cancer. For a creature from another planet, our sun's rays could be deadly. You can imagine life forms from another world coming here and finding the UV light here to be stunningly bright and require extensive sun shields and sunglasses and other ways to protect themselves. And then there is Earth's invisible hazard for aliens, gravity. A visitor from another planet might find Earth's gravity a challenge. Humans have grown up with it in bodies designed for 1G. If we subject our own bodies to extreme gravity, the consequences can be disastrous. Fighter pilots making extreme turns can experience forces as high as 9 Gs. That means that a 160-pound pilot feels like he weighs over 1,500 pounds. Anything above 9 Gs, the pressure becomes too great, and the pilot will black out. Aliens from a planet with less gravity would probably experience a similar effect. Say the Martians came to Earth. Well, on Mars, the gravity's a third. On Earth, the gravity would be higher for them. So even if they were fit by Martian standards, they might find this high gravity a drag, but it's not hard to postulate them have the technology to allow them to operate in higher gravity. A far less predictable danger facing a visiting alien is germs. Just as in H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, simple bacteria might be deadly to visiting aliens. 
the bacteria on one planet could have serious consequences for organisms on another planet. When the Martians come, they invade Earth, they kill off the armies of Earth with no problem, but then the bacteria on Earth infect the Martians and kill them. In the end, Earth wins the War of the Worlds, but not because of the prowess of human technology, but because of the biochemical diversity of the bacteria. History has shown that there is good reason for visitors from another world to be cautious, and for us to be cautious about them. When the Spanish invaded the Americas, they brought a far deadlier weapon than their guns and swords. They brought smallpox, the flu, and other illnesses. When those barriers were reduced and life spread between the New World and the Old World, there was a lot of death and destruction as a result of that. We might contaminate visiting aliens, or they might contaminate us. This fear of infection from new species of bacteria also troubled NASA during the moon exploration of the 1960s. They placed the first astronauts returning from the moon in quarantine in case they carried deadly space germs. McKay hopes that an alien civilization exploring the universe would also be careful not to contaminate planets with their bugs. One would imagine that an alien civilization with the technology to move between worlds would have the sense to realize the same problem and have strict biological barriers and controls. They wouldn't just land and go out for a picnic and spread out their stuff on another world. It's clear that the occupants of an alien spacecraft traveling to Earth would face a catalog of dangers. First, they would have to survive the destructive forces within a wormhole, then avoid burning up in the Earth's atmosphere, and finally, protect themselves from poisonous oxygen or deadly germs. Perhaps alien visitors would decide not to take the risk themselves. What if they send explorers who never age and who never die from deadly diseases? The most efficient way is with robots. These are self-replicating nanobots. Nanobots are miniature robots, minute and lightweight enough to be potentially invaluable in space travel. One of the major factors in traveling fast through space is weight. The smaller you are, the faster you can go. In fact, subatomic particles can travel at near the speed of light. So tiny nanobots may be the best way of exploring the universe. Scientists believe that it might be possible to create microscopic nanobots able to clone themselves. These would land on moons and planets and self-replicate, allowing an alien civilization to explore vast tracts of the galaxy without ever leaving their home planet. Eventually, you would have a sphere of perhaps trillions of robots expanding near the speed of light, landing on moons, each robot creating other robots. That's the most scientifically reasonable way to explore the galaxy. That's how nature does it. That's how viruses work. Humans are already exploring the cosmos using robots. NASA's Voyager probes are heading deep into space sending back data as they go. And robotic rovers have explored the surface of other planets in our solar system. But because of their size, it appears that nanobots could be the most logical way to explore the universe. But so far, there is no evidence that alien nanobots have ever visited Earth. And even if they have, will we be able to detect them? The vast majority of people who claim to have had close encounters in fact describe not miniature robots, but living alien creatures, often none too friendly, and prone to abducting, probing, and experimenting upon their victims. An advanced alien civilization might be able to manipulate physics and cross time and space to visit Earth. But some scientists question why on Earth would they want to? They suggest that beings capable of traveling through space and time would be millions of years more advanced than humans 
and would find life on Earth of little interest. And even if they do want to make contact, they might not be friendly. Based upon the human race's own history of confrontation, Michael Shermer, publisher of Skeptic Magazine, has his own theory. If you go by what happens here on Earth, we would never want to come into contact with E.T. We would be eaten or enslaved or killed because that's what happens here, so that's not good. Even so, some people claim to have already had a close encounter with extraterrestrials. Some even claim to have been abducted by them. The alien abduction experience is a fascinating one. These stories have all the earmarks of a very human kind of experience. It's a type of night terror. It's a, it's a bad dream. Because there is no evidence, outlandish accounts of alien visitation are greeted with disbelief. So most claimants are keen to conceal their identity. One woman from New York, who we have named Molly, claims to have experienced repeated visitations throughout her life. Probably the um, most strangest um, and disturbing memory that I have is of a dream with a white paw um, coming into my neck and placing a tiny little stick in it. And when I woke up that morning, I was very shocked to find um, a strange, painful lump on my neck. And when I felt it, because I thought it was a pimple, I discovered a, something hard in there, the shape of a piece of rice. According to Molly, the tiny implant worked its way deep into her body. And before she could get medical advice, it disappeared without a trace. Another encounter that she vividly remembers actually involved being taken on board an alien spacecraft. I recall being in, I'm gonna call it a clamshell, but it was more like a scallop. Um, and it had a top and a bottom. And I can recall being inside of it and the top closed over you. I experienced medical procedures with very strange types of devices. One of the beings was very tall and very thin and very insect-like. Like most people who claim to have met aliens, Molly has no evidence at all to back up her story. And skeptics consider that experiences like hers are more to do with popular culture than extraterrestrials. Most people just give the default explanation that comes to mind, which is whatever they've been seeing on television and reading in popular magazines and books. Over hundreds of years, the phenomenon of visitations has manifested itself in a variety of guises. In the Middle Ages, people reported stories of angels and demons, while a hundred years ago, reports spoke of spirits and ghosts. Many scientists, including Shermer, believe that a combination of sci-fi stories, movies, and real-life exploration of space encourages people to manifest their fears in the form of alien visitations. The aliens are our angels. They are our demons. That, that's who we personify as these weird anomalies. We call them aliens because that's what we're into. We're in the space age, in the age of science fiction. <laughs> However, that does not completely explain what causes people to believe they have experienced a visitation. Dr. Michael Persinger, from Laurentian University in Canada, believes he has discovered a link between the alien visitation sensation and electromagnetic fields. He suggests that fluctuations in electromagnetic activity could stimulate a reaction in the brains of certain individuals and account for most alien visitation experiences. The experience of a presence occurring usually late at night and either producing a mystical experience or a sexual experience or even a terrifying experience shows up in all cultures. And we now realize that this sensed presence is built into the human brain itself. Persinger believes that it is possible to induce something like an alien visitation experience in almost anyone. He does this by creating a complex electromagnetic field in his laboratory and applying it to people's brains. To demonstrate, Persinger and his assistant place a volunteer inside a soundproof chamber. Electrodes producing the magnetic field are attached to the subject's head. 
Then he is blindfolded and the lights are dimmed. Persinger monitors his stats and waits for his subject to experience a feeling similar to that of an alien presence. Mr. Booth, can you hear me? Yeah. I'll float with the experiences. If you wish to report them aloud, go right ahead. Within minutes, the electromagnetic fields trigger a shocking reaction in the subject's brain. How he describes it is going to be a function of his culture, his experiences, and his expectancy. Oh, sorry, a lot. It feels like a dime. At this point, Persinger stops the experiment. In this study, the subject is visualizing the presence in a terrifying way. I've never had any feeling like that ever. It just made me feel a little trapped, and it hurt. I don't know, closest I've ever been to hell. It just, it was an awful place to be. The volunteer was extremely sensitive to the electromagnetic fields which stimulated his brain. However, this technique demonstrates the extraordinary power of our brain to turn our fears into monsters and demons and even aliens from distant worlds. Dozens of people who have had experiences that they attributed to alien abductions and experiences. When we put them through the chamber, they have a very similar experience. The terrifying experiences induced in the chamber are caused by channeled electromagnetic fields. Persinger believes that abduction experiences in the real world are caused by electromagnetic fields created by natural phenomena, such as sun flares, seismic activity, and changes in atmospheric conditions. And it's thought that our common physiology and global culture is responsible for the similarity in the accounts. Inevitably, we're all gonna have similar experiences because our brains are wired that way. We'll see the same kinds of illusions, we'll have the same kinds of hallucinations, and so on. The role of electromagnetism in alien experiences is far from proven. Some researchers suggest that sleep paralysis or conditions like post-traumatic stress are to blame. But until we've made contact with E.T., we may never know if aliens are all in the mind or not. And if E.T. did reveal itself, there could be another barrier to overcome. Language. It may be that aliens don't choose to talk with us at all. They may decide to talk to one of the other species that inhabits the Earth. And that could be whichever species they consider possesses the most intelligent language. It may be possible for aliens to cross the interstellar void, to land on Earth, and to adjust for survival in our atmosphere. But communicating with us in any meaningful way may prove to be the hardest step of all. We are arrogant to believe that they're gonna want to actually talk to us and, and visit us. I mean, why? Think of ants in an anthill. If someone is building a five-lane superhighway right next to the anthill, would the ants know how to communicate with the workers? The main danger is that these workers will simply pave over the anthill and not even realize what they've done. In San Francisco, a few scientists are already studying ways of communicating should E.T. ever come to call. Leading the hunt is SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. For the last 40 years, SETI scientists have been monitoring the skies, listening for messages from alien species. SETI is just about every field you can imagine applied to the search for life in the universe. SETI scientist Lawrence Doyle believes that the key to communicating with aliens is first to understand their level of intelligence. And for that, he needs to establish how organisms communicate. There hasn't been a search for extraterrestrial intelligence yet. There's only been a search for extraterrestrial technology. We plan to make it a search for intelligence 
by understanding the laws that create communication so that if we get signals, we can tell it's a communication as opposed to random astrophysical processes. By understanding the laws that dictate communication, Doyle can identify and separate real patterns of communication from random noise. To do this, he uses a mathematical equation known as information theory, which was originally developed to quantify the amount of information sent down telephone lines. Doyle uses it to analyze the complexity of a language. He calculates the interdependency of different words or sounds within the language. The greater the number of words or sounds that can be strung together that are dependent on the first word or sound in the sequence, the more complex the language. On this scale, English is a level nine communication system. Doyle now plans to use the same technique on alien communication. And the higher the complexity, the more superior the intelligence. Any alien or extraterrestrial message has to obey the rules of information theory. There's no other way to transmit information. And if we can measure how complex their communication is, it may be an indicator of how complex an extraterrestrial society is. But information theory can only help Doyle understand the complexity of an alien signal, not the content. So even if he spots ET, he won't know what ET is saying. It's the same problem we have on Earth when humans try and communicate to other species. If you smile at a wolf, it does not mean I'm happy. It means you want to pick a fight. If you smile at a chimpanzee, it means you're scared. So even a smile doesn't work. How do you communicate with an alien is a tricky point. We can't even agree on the same symbols of greeting among species on Earth. Doyle has been using information theory to discern patterns and rules in animal communication and study their complexity. The results have been surprising. With his current data, Doyle has found that squirrel monkeys have a level three communication system, while dolphins have a level four. So who does Doyle think might be the best candidates to communicate with aliens? So far, he's not convinced that either dolphins or humans have the necessary linguistic skills. But he has found a species on Earth with a communication level much, much higher. Humpback whales we're majoring in because they look like they will have the absolutely most complex uh, communication system, maybe on the planet. Doyle's study of humpbacks is in its early stages. And so far, he has only studied their social calls. But it may be that when extraterrestrials talk to the Earth species with the most intelligent language, they won't talk with us. They'll talk to humpback whales instead. But despite listening to the universe for four decades, SETI has yet to discover a single confirmed extraterrestrial signal. To actually find real aliens, we may need to look in a different place, a place closer to home. Perhaps we should take a closer look at ourselves. When you look in the mirror, perhaps you are looking at a Martian. It's always amusing to me when I hear people talking about UFOs and aliens. But for me, it's the bacteria. There could be bacteria here that are really alien. Life on Earth could have come from Mars, and we could all be aliens here. McKay and other scientists believe there's a chance that billions of years ago, alien bacteria were blasted from the surface of another planet and carried away in a meteorite. The meteorite might have eventually crash landed on Earth, spilling out the bacteria, allowing it to grow and flourish. It's a process called panspermia. If panspermia is true, you and I are aliens in the sense that our life did not develop on the planet that we're living now. Professor Jay Malosh of the University of Arizona has studied meteorites that have landed on Earth to see if they could have transported life from other worlds. This meteorite is a piece of Martian basalt. Where it came from was a large meteorite impact on the surface of Mars. It's almost an ideal delivery mechanism. It's ideal 
because the rock protects the bacteria from radiation and extreme temperatures in space. It would also protect it from the impact of crash landing on Earth. To test whether bacteria could travel safely through the cosmos, Malish and his colleague Wayne Nicholson conduct an extreme survival experiment. They inject a large block of rock with bacteria and take the sample to the Ames Vertical Gun Laboratory near San Francisco. The block's placed inside a large vacuum chamber. Ready? And Malosh then fires a projectile into it at over 13,000 miles per hour. It absolutely destroyed the rock target. It blasted into tiny fragments. Amazingly, despite the rock being virtually vaporized, the bacteria survive intact. If they could survive, it's not a big stretch to think that uh, organisms on the surface of another planet could also survive meteorite impact and launch into interplanetary space. The experiment shows that bacteria could not only survive the vacuum of space, but also the impact of landing on Earth. One theory is that bacteria from another world evolved over millions of years to form life as we know it. So perhaps all life on our planet is alien in origin. We human beings, life, plants, animals, everything we see descended from that common Martian ancestor. That's a possibility. We may go to Mars and suddenly see, well, that's where great, great, great grandma lived. Because of the vast size of our galaxy, aliens, even highly advanced ones, may never have visited Earth in spaceships. All UFO sightings may well be no more than a simple misinterpretation of what we are seeing. And alien visitations, a product of our overactive imaginations. But aliens might have been here all along. We and all the species on our world could be the direct descendants of extraterrestrial life forms. In the strangest twist of all, perhaps we are the aliens.